that you wouldn't be gone long. I knew it would be different, yet I never imagined that not too long would turn out to be never, because if truth be told, I never really got my mother back. It's time to go, Mommy said as she picked up her suitcase. My sister Mago, my brother Carlos, and I grabbed the plastic bags filled with our clothes. We stood at the threshold of the little house we had been renting from a man named Don Ruben and looked around us one last time. Mommy's brothers were packing our belongings to be stored at my grandmother's house. A refrigerator that didn't work, but the mommy hoped to fix one day. The bed Mago and I had shared with mommy ever since papi left. The wardrobe we had decorated with the Chavo de Locho stickers to hide the places where the paint had peeled off. The house was almost empty now. Later that day, mommy would be handing the key back to Don Ruben, and this would no longer be our home, but someone else's. As we were about to step into the sunlight, I caught a glimpse of papi. Theo Gatti was putting a photo of him into a box. I ran to take the photo from my uncle. Why are you taking that? Mommy said as we headed down the third road to Papi's mother's house, where we would be living from then on. He's my Papi, I said, and I clutched the frame tight against my chest. I know that, Mommy said. Your grandmother has pictures of your father at her house. You don't need to take it with you. But this is my Papi, I told her again. She didn't understand that this paper face behind a wall of glass was the only father I had ever known. I'll stop right there. So this is the very beginning of the distance between us. And one of the, the things that I, that I talk about um, is how immigration affected my family. And just to put it in context for you, um, a, few, a few months ago, the Pew Hispanic Center um, release a study that showed that, that the largest wave of immigration from Mexico has come to a standstill. And this wave lasted for 40 years. It began in the 70s. And this is the context of my own family's immigration. And, and I'm sure that many of you have relatives who also immigrated during those years. But so my father um, left Mexico in 1977 when I was two years old. And when the story begins, it's 1980. My father has been here for, for a few years. And one of the reasons why my father came out was to earn money so that he could build us a house in Mexico. And that was his dream of you know, coming here temporarily, um, make lots of dollars, go home, and build us a real house, which is a brick and concrete house. And things didn't work out like that for him. So a few years later, Instead of him coming back empty-handed and with his head held low, he decided to send for my mother so that she could come here and help him work. And um, together, they would be able to build us this house. So this is why, you know, at the beginning of the story, we're packing up our stuff, and my mother's walking us to my grandmother's house where we're going to be staying. And this photo that I mentioned, you know, I still have this photo, it was an 8 by 10 black and white photograph of my father. And eventually I started to call, you know, this, this photograph, the man behind the glass, because that was my father and that was the only father that I had known. And that was the only father I knew for the eight years that he was gone. So um, throughout the story, you know, I, I talk about what it was like for my siblings and I to lose our parents to the United States. And just like I mentioned in the book, that to me, the United States was something more powerful than La Llorona because, you know, it took away parents and it was a place where most parents went to and, and didn't come back from. So this was, you know, the United States, in, in my mind, was just this really large, powerful presence. And, and to me, it had taken away my parents because I didn't understand at that point in my life that it was my, my parents who had made the, the decision to, to go. And I didn't understand what was behind that decision. You know, I didn't know about the economy in Mexico, the national debt crisis, the, the um, recession, you know, Mexico experienced a, a really huge recession that I hadn't seen in 50 years. So I didn't understand all these things. And for the most part, you know, my, my childhood is defined 
by my parents' absence. And it was defined by a lot of fear because I was afraid that, that something would happen to them and I would never see them again. I was also afraid that they would forget about me. And one of these fears came from the fact that not too long after my mother came here to, to join my father, um, she called us one day and she said, I'm going to have a baby. And my siblings and I, back in Mexico, we felt that we were getting replaced with children that were going to be made in the USA and they were going to be born in this special place. And we said, well, why, why would our parents want us now? So a lot of, a lot of you know, conflicting emotions that, that we were dealing with at the time. And this is an experience that, you know, that didn't just happen to me or to my siblings. It's a common experience. Um, you know, right now, something that has been really, you know, pressing in my mind that, that I've been talking a lot about is the DREAM Act and the DREAMers. And these are the young, undocumented people that were brought here as children. And to me, like, I, I relate so much to them because I know that, that that we share similar stories. And um, one of the things about the book that I really hope is that when people read it, they're able to get an insight into what this experience is like, you know, for, for children to, to be dealing and, you know, living in this situation. Um, many of them were also separated from their parents, and this is what that experience is like. So one of the things that I learned um, in my creative writing classes was that you you write write the book that you want to read, and this is something that has driven me a lot with all with all my books. You know, I, to me, it's always like, what what would I like to read? What would I like to see out there? And one of the things that that is common with all my books and even my short stories is that I'm I'm always writing about um, the immigrant experience. And I, I like to write about it in different perspectives, you know, not just write about what it's like to be an immigrant in the U.S., but I also write about the other side of that, which is, you know, what the people that get left behind go through and what their experience is like, because it was something that, that I went through. So the, the, first, the first half of the book, is, it takes place in Mexico. And it deals specifically with my relationship with my mother. Because as I mentioned in my reading, you know, that, that um, if truth be told, I never really got my mother back. And the reason why I said that is because, you know, my mother's experience in the U.S. changed her a lot. And she did come back to Mexico a few years later, but she came back a different person and a different mother than the one that, that had left. So I didn't really get that mother back. I got back a different mother. And, um, and what happened here in, in the US that really changed my mom was the fact that even though she had made the choice to leave her kids behind to follow her husband and come here, and part of the reason why she did that was because she, she was trying to save her marriage. You know, we had heard so many horror stories about the husbands who come here who forget about the wives they left behind, who start new families here. And this was a fear that my mother had that made her choose to leave her kids so that she could go to her husband's side and try to, to keep her family together, you know, keep her marriage. And the irony was, and there's many ironies in the book, is that um, even though she, she did, she made that sacrifice, uh, she wasn't able to save her marriage, and my father did end up leaving her for another woman once she was here. So when she came back to Mexico a few years later, um, she came back very bitter, heartbroken, and she came back more soft than when she had first left. She came back with no husband, no money, and with a new baby in her arms to, to raise and, and, and feed. So my mother came back to us, and things were never the same, you know. Um, so that's something that, that I write about in the book, about, about that relationship. And, and the title of the book, The Distance Between Us, it addresses not just the physical distance, you know, it's 2,000 miles that were separated from our parents, but once they come back, one by one, there's also another kind of distance, uh, emotional distance. And that was something, to me, that was the most difficult to deal with, because how, how, do, you, how do you deal with, with that kind of, 
you know, what kind of distance. Um, so the first part of the book ends with my own border crossing. And I came to the U.S. in 1985. I was going on 10 when my father returned to Mexico. And he had managed to build us this dream house. And it took him eight years away from us to build this house. And one of the ironies is that even though he was separated from us for eight years, um, and you know he was here working in the U.S., sending money back to me in Mexico, to, so my grandparents were overseeing this the construction of the house. Um, we never lived in that house, not even for one day. And eventually, my aunt stole the house from him, so he lost this house that took him took him so much sacrifice to build. So he lost this house eventually. And when he came back in 85, he, um, he wasn't gonna come back to Mexico anymore to live because a lot of things had changed and one of those was that he had a new wife who wasn't gonna come back to my dusty little town in, in Mexico. And he also, you know, the national debt crisis was creating that wave of immigration that I mentioned earlier. A lot of people were leaving, everybody was leaving, not coming back. And he realized that, you know, he couldn't come back anymore because there were no jobs there. And he had found a job here as a maintenance worker and he didn't want to give up that job. And then also um, when when he decided not to, not to come back to Mexico, he, he, he decided to bring us here instead. And at first, um, he wasn't gonna bring me because I was nine and a half. And he said to me, you cannot make that border crossing. Because we had to come here, you know, illegally. We were undocumented. And he said, you cannot make the border crossing. I'll come back for you. And I said, the last time you left, you were gone eight years. So I worked very hard to convince my father to not leave me behind. And my older siblings also, you know, they, they worked very hard to convince them. And my older sister said, I'm not leaving without her. And eventually we convinced my father and he decided to bring all of us. And he was even going to bring my little sister too. But my mother would not allow that. So when we came to the U.S., um, we traded we traded my mother, my little sister, my grandmothers, my cousins, my aunts, my uncles for our father. And it was a, a big a big sacrifice, you know, to walk away from that family that I had to follow a man that I didn't even know. You know, my father was a stranger to me, but I followed him. And and he was right, you know, when he said, Oh, you're too little to make the border crossing. He was right, we did get caught several times, and it was because I was too little. I was always complaining that I was tired, that I was hungry, that I was thirsty, and my father had to carry me on his back many times as we were running through the border. So we got caught the first two times, and then the third time, uh, my father said, this is it. If you don't make it this time, I'm gonna send you back to Mexico. So luckily we did make, we made it the third time. And um, and it was a, a really wonderful, wonderful experience to be able to, to get across the border and to say, now maybe I can finally have a family, you know, have a father. So that's where um, the first part of the, of the memoir ends with that journey, you know, of getting here. And the second part of the memoir, I focus on my life here in the U.S. and and it deals with with the immigrant experience, you know, the learning a language, becoming adjusted in in um, in a new way of life, new culture. But one of the things that I mostly talk about in the memoir is um, trying to reconnect with my father and our inability to do so, and the, the constant struggle, you know, to 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 try to overcome that that um, gap that immigration had created between us. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna read to you um, an excerpt from the second part of the book that takes place right after my first day of school in the US, just to give you a little sense of, of what it was like for me as an immigrant to, to come here and to start school here. And then I'm gonna open it up for questions. I wanna hear from you guys. Okay. By 
the end of the day, I still hadn't fully memorized the alphabet and the numbers in English. I walked back home feeling scared. I thought about the trip to the beach, of Papi holding my hand. I wish things would always be like that for me, but they wouldn't be like that if I didn't do well in school. Papi has said so. I wanted to make my father proud. It still bothered me, as it would for many years, that my father had not wanted to bring me at first. And because of that, I had a desperate desire for him to one day say, Chata, you've made me a proud father. I'm so glad I didn't leave you in Mexico and instead brought you here. I felt as if I owed him something, as if there was a debt that needed to be repaid. The way I could pay it back was to make him proud of my accomplishments because they would be his accomplishments too. Even now, there are times when I think back on that moment when I begged my father to bring me to this country and the knowledge that he could have said no still haunts me. What would my life have been like then? I know the answer all too well. Since I got out of school before Carlos and Mago, Papi told me to go to the neighbor's house and stay there until Mago arrived to pick me up. Mrs. Giuliano lived right across the street from us. She was an old lady with hair like cotton and eyes the color of my birthstone, sapphire. Her sweet smile reminded me of my grandmother, although she had a row of perfect teeth, unlike my grandmother's gap tooth smile. She didn't speak much Spanish, but she spoke Italian and English. She was the first Italian I had ever met. When she opened the door, she said, Buongiorno, bambina. She smiled and pulled me into her house. It smelled of bread and garlic. You hungry, Mrs. Giuliano asked. She pointed to the stove where she was making minestrone. Si, tengo hambre, I said. I sat on the stool and she gave me a bowl of the soup. She asked me a question in both Italian and English, but I only understood the words escuela and school. No good, I said, shaking my head. No pude aprender inglés. Give it time, bambina. Time? She was right. Time is what I needed. But back then I thought that I would never be able to stop feeling as if I didn't belong in that classroom. After my meal, Mrs. Giuliano took me to her backyard where she kept chickens in a coop. As I helped her clean it, the smell of chicken poop and feathers reminded me of my grandmother's doves. The smell made me even more nostalgic for Mexico. I touched my belly button and I remember the bond that tied me to my mother and to my country. Would it be so terrible to be sent back, I wondered. Even though I like this beautiful place, I still miss my home. It still called to me in different ways. A pigeon resting on the roof of the house, its goose traveling down the vent of the heater in the living room. I would stop and listen, letting my mind travel back to my grandmother's shack, and I would remember waking up to the cooing of her doves. Mexico was also in a cup of hot chocolate, the steam curling up into the air. I would inhale Mexico through my nostrils. While at the supermarket with my stepmother, picking up vegetables and herbs, crushing cilantro leaves with my fingers, bringing a bunch of epazote up to my nose, I would think of meals in Mexico, of a pot of beans boiling, of my grandmother adding epazote leaves for flavor. Mexico was in the whistle of the midnight train traveling on the tracks that run parallel to Figueroa Street. I would awaken to the sound of the train's whistle and my, mind, my body would fill with longing. When my sister and I cleaned the beans before putting them on to boil, we would pick up the clumps of dirt and moisten them with our tongues to smell the scent of wet earth. I thought about the dirt floor of my grandmother's shack, or how we would sprinkle water on it before sweeping it so as not to unsettle the dirt. If I returned to Mexico, then I could see my little sister, my mother, and my sweet grandmother again. I would also get to keep, to keep my two last names. I would be in a classroom where I understood what my teacher said. But what about my dream of one day making Papi proud? I stood there in Mrs. Giuliano's backyard feeling as if I were tearing in half. Where do I belong, I wonder. Do I belong here? Do I belong there? Do I belong anywhere? All right.
<clears throat> so these are the questions that I try to address in the book later on about the sense of belonging, wondering, you know, where where I fit in. And this was a, a, a journey that I had to take to discover, you know, where where I belonged. And one of the things that I really love about, you know, about writing is that it has really given me, um, you know, it's given me a great gift in that writing to me has become like my bridge that connects both countries. And I, I, once I started to write and once I started to, to get deeper into, you know, telling my stories and writing about Mexico, writing about the U.S., I realized that I didn't have to wonder anymore where I belonged, you know, that I could belong in both places, that I could take the best of, of what Mexico gave me and take the best of what the U.S. gave me and, and be happy with that, you know, with, with everything that both countries has given me. So this is something that, that I, you know, that I discovered in the process of becoming a writer, that I didn't have to wonder anymore where, where I belonged. So I want to I wanna open it up for, for some questions, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your thoughts on, on the book or any questions. Yes. When you go through the whole process, did you have that many time when you had like reservations about writing it? Did you ever say, I, I, I can't do this or I'm not going to do it? Oh, yeah. All the time. All the time I go through that. But that's something that you know that needs to be that that needs to be faced and addressed and overcome. And definitely, when you know when I when I transferred from PCC, I went up to UC Santa Cruz, and this was something that Diana encouraged me to do because she said, you know, you you need to get out of your comfort zone. And and for a time there, I was thinking about going to UCLA, but I was very lucky that I got Diana to to give me good advice, and she's. She uh, encouraged me to go to Santa Cruz, and that's where I ended up as a creative writing major. And my first, my first novel was really my failed attempt to write a memoir because I wanted to write about my experience, you know, of, of being in Mexico and then coming here. And at the time, um, when I was a student at Santa Cruz, there wasn't a whole lot of, of awareness about, you know, the, the children and the experiences that that. Uh, that children have um, when their parents leave them behind to come here. And it's it's been in the last 10 years that we've seen books like Enrique's Journey, uh, documentaries, you know, like Which Way Home or Those Who Remain. There's been some other films like um, Under the Same Moon. So there's been a whole lot of awareness about this experience that I write about. But back then we, did, we didn't have that yet. And I, I wanted to write my experiences but it proved to be too painful, and I couldn't overcome that, that block. So I turned it into fiction, and that's how I was able to get around that, that, that pain and, and, um, and fictionalize the story, and I created a character to stand in for me. And whenever things got tough in the writing and I didn't want to go there, I would tell myself, well, this is not you, this is your character. This is the, what's happening to her, not to you. So that's how I was able to overcome that, that, that block with the first book. And with this, with the memoir, because you know, I, um, I was writing about my own experiences and I had to, you know, what, one of the things with writers is that writers live things twice. Because you know, you live it once and then when you're writing about it, you have to live it all over again. And, and my, my childhood was something I did not want to live all over again. But you know, as I was writing it, I had to, and there were many moments when I wanted to stop and not go there because it was just too too painful to to live through again. But I think what really helped me was that I I already had two novels under my belt. You know, I had developed enough writing skills that I was able to to get past those emotional blocks and to bring in my writer self and say, no, you can do this. You know, you can do this. So that's how I was able to overcome all of those blocks. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's always um, something that, that is difficult to do. And especially for me, with my writing is always so personal, whether I'm writing fiction or nonfiction, I always write from like, you know, this personal place. 
and and yes, the, the blocks are always there, but you know, if I'm gonna be a writer, if I'm gonna write in an honest way, I, I need to get past that point. Yeah. How did you get past, um, how did you get, how did you deal with the feeling of absence and relax? How did I deal with with the neglect? The, the theme of absence in life. The theme of absence in 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 the writing. Um, well, I was I was writing about that experience, right? Of of the the absent parents, and this is something that's really common in in all my books. I'm always writing about the absent parents, and it's something you know that 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 really affected me as I was growing up. So I always write about that. I don't know why, I try not to. I try not to, but it always comes back into my writing. But one of the things that I, that I discovered as I was writing the memoir that really, really helped me is that you know it really allowed me to start looking at my parents through different perspectives. Because for a long time, I only saw them through one through one lens, you know, through that, that daughter that got left behind. And there was a lot of anger in the writing. And, um, and, and the more I worked on it, and I worked on this book for four years. So the more I worked on it, and the more I was able to look at my parents from different angles, you know, like their childhoods, and I looked at who they were as people, and what fears they had, what dreams they had. It really helped me to come to terms with the way I had seen them before, before just through that one lens and, and that resentment about being abandoned. So it, it helped me, if anything that the memoir did for me was that it really helped me to come to terms with that, you know, with that absence and, and with that fear that I had. And, and I worked out a lot of those things in, within the, the writing itself. Yes? Did having children and being a parent change your perspective? Yes, it has changed my perspective a lot, you know, being a parent, because it helps me to see things from a, from a, different, a different angle. And, you know, one of the things right now, like I have my, my daughter who's four and a half and she's, she's right here. I see, I see myself so much in my daughter because you know, she's the exact same age I was when my mother left. And my, my writing career, you know, it, it uh, forces me to, to travel a lot. You know, I have to, I have to go all over the country to, to promote my writing. And so I have to leave home. And it's, it's always very hard because, you know, when I'm, when I'm gonna leave and my daughter says, how long will you be gone? I think about myself at that age and, and how I asked my mother that question. And I, I, I put myself in my mother's position and said, well, now I understand how she felt to be torn between being a mom and wanting to stay with her kids and not also being a woman and wanting to go out into the world to pursue you know, her own desires, her own dreams. So I do, I completely understand, you know, and I, in that moment when, when I'm leaving home, that's, that's when I, I come to a very deep understanding of who my mother was and what situation she was in, and, and, and I understand her and I, I completely forgive her. At what point in life did I know that I was gonna become a writer? It wasn't until I got to PCC that I knew I was gonna become a writer. <laughs> Um, and you know, I started writing early on. I was 13 when I began to write, but I never saw myself as a writer because first, I had never met a, a writer, and second, the books that I read were not written by people like me, you know, Latinos, and the books that I was reading didn't have any Latinos in it. So I, I kind of thought maybe Latinos didn't write books or something. So I didn't, I never saw writing in my future. It was something that I like to do at home in my journal, but I never thought, oh, this is what I want to be. So, um, 
When I came to PCC, I was actually taking art classes because I wanted to be an animator for Walt Disney. And I was always here, the art, the art building, I think that's where all the art classes were. So I was always taking art classes there, and that's what I wanted to do. And then it wasn't until I met Diana, who, um, she was the one who started to encourage me to, to take, take my writing more seriously, and she would tell me, you know, you're, you're a good writer. But what happened, you know, when I met Diana is that I, I was having a very difficult time at home. You know, the, the, the things that I mentioned, you know, about coming here to live with my dad, um, things were not, were not very um, easy to deal with. That being separated from him, you know, we, we were complete strangers to, to each other. And for many years before I came to PCC, we had been struggling and struggling to, to reconnect and we just weren't able to do it. And then one of the reasons was because my father was um, suffering from alcoholism. He had a very violent temper. And, and um, then um, before I came to PCC, my, my siblings, or bo both my older siblings dropped out of college, which is one of the reasons why my father did not let me go to college, because he said I was going to drop out too, so why, why even bother going to UC Irvine? So when I met Diana, this is, this is the history that I brought with me. You know, I was this 18-year-old girl dealing with all these problems at home. I was suffering from, from low self-esteem. Um, I didn't know who I was or, you know, what. Um, I, I didn't know a whole lot. I didn't have enough confidence in myself. But I, I had that dream of going to, to, you know, getting an education. I did have that dream. But I didn't know what I wanted to do yet. So Diana was the one who gave me my very first book that I got to keep, and that was The Moths and Other Stories by Elena Maria Viramontes. And she gave me that for my 19th birthday. And she also introduced me to Sandra Cisneros, whom I had never heard of and I had never read before um, until I met Diana. So once she started to, to, um, to share all, all this literature with me and exposing me to Latina writers, that the seed began to grow. And one of the greatest things about, about you know, meeting Diana was that when, not too long after I met her, my father was arrested for spousal abuse. And my, mother, my stepmother ended up in the hospital um, after an altercation that they had. And I was so scared because I didn't know what was gonna happen. And my, just my family life was falling apart and I didn't know what to do. And I went to, to look for Diana during her office hours, and I told her what was happening at home. And Diana said, you know, Renita, you come live with me. And that's how I, I ended up um, going to live with Diana. She lived right here across the street on Bonnie. And I went to live with her, and that was one of the best times that I've ever had in my life, because living, living with her, you know, one of the, the greatest things was to have to have that one person that I could count on and who was there for me when I really needed someone. And sometimes like when I talk about my siblings, you know, because they, they, they didn't finish college. And sometimes we, we talk about our college experience and my, my older sister said to me, well, I didn't have a Diana. And I think if I had a Diana, I think I would have been able to, to make it too. So it makes such a huge difference to have, to have someone in your life that, that you can count on. And I was very lucky to, to have found Diana, who, who was that person for me. So the, to me, you know, ever since then, I've always wanted to be like her. So everything that I always do, like I always want to give back and I always want to um, you know, one of the things that, that, I really, um, that really resonated with me and with a lot of people during the Democratic um, National Convention was what Michelle Obama said, that when you cross the, the, the door of success, you don't slam it shut, you turn around and you leave it open for the next person. And that's something that I also learned from Diana because that's the way she is and that's what she taught me to do. And, and that's what I've been doing too, you know, like 
I've been able to accomplish the dreams that I set for myself, and now I'm turning around and I want to help the, the, the other kids, the next generation who also has those dreams. I want to help them to reach their dreams. Yes? I want to look around first. Uh, Diana is my favorite teacher, too. I just wanted to make sure there's no other teachers in the classroom. <laughs> and she really is. And I don't know if she's still teaching. I keep on looking for a class and I don't see any. But if there are any students in here, you, you need to take one of her classes. <laughs> you, really, you really do. Honestly, you do. But the question I wanted to ask you, when you're talking about your siblings, how, what was their reaction when you wanted to put this memoir out? Because it involved them, too. I mean, it's part of their story, too. Yeah, you know, I've, had, um, I've been really lucky because my siblings have been very supportive. And since the very beginning when I started writing the memoir, you know, I told them I want to write this book about our journey. And every time I would finish a draft, I would give it to them. And they would always read it. And of course, my older sister would always say, well, that's not how it happened. It was like this. And uh, so I worked with them, with, with all of them, to, to get this done. And I, they gave me their memories because, you know, there were a lot of things that I didn't remember. And my older sister, who, who took, you know, she, even though she's only four years older than me, when my parents left, she became the parent. And she raised me. And she knew exactly what our situation was and what we were in for when my mother left. And um, so she had a whole lot of memories to give me. And then I interviewed my brother, which was really helpful to do because my, my whole childhood, was dominated by my sister's presence because she was my little mother. But my brother was always kind of on the, on the periphery, you know, and I didn't have a whole lot of memories about him. So when I interviewed him, he remembered so many things that, that I, you know, I didn't remember because, and they were from his point of view, things that he cared about. So I included those memories into the story to, to kind of develop him as a character, you know, and, and and um, so it, 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 it all worked out with my siblings. They were, they were really wonderful. And, and they're still, you know, they, they love the book and, and my nieces and nephews have been reading it. And, and it's just um, one of the, the themes in the book is remembering where you, where you come from. And, and this is a book that is especially meaningful for me because I want my nieces and nephews and my kids to remember their roots and, and where they come from. And, you know, in, in, I think with every immigrant family, you always see how things start to change, you know, with the new generations forgetting, losing touch with, with um, their parents' origins, with the culture. And this is something that I'm seeing even in my own family. That's why I really wanted to get this book out too, because I'm starting to see that loss, you know, that, that they're forgetting where, where um, their parents are from. And, and even um, not too long ago, my older sister, her, her 18 year old son told her that he wants to become a border patrol agent and keep all the Mexicans out. And, and this, is, this is my nephew. This is my nephew. His mother came here as an undocumented immigrant. His father came here as an undocumented immigrant. And he's saying that, you know, that he wants to keep the Mexicans out. And, and, and it's like, here you go, kid. <laughs> this is where you come from. Don't forget. And uh, so, so that's something that I always tell people, you know, especially the younger people, is like, don't, for, don't forget where you come from, because once you do that, you know, you're, you're really um, disrespecting your, your ancestors. Yes, we'll do two, two more or one more? Okay. What about when you write about your life and you want to write about it from the very own scene, but the people don't, I mean, the other people well, you could tell that if you're you're right, like if you're writing a memoir, and people don't want you to to tell it that way, or you know, well, yeah. you could say, well, write your own memoir, <laughs> <laughs> tell it your way. <laughs> 
I mean, the, the thing, you know, the thing with memoir is, is memoir is like how you remember your life, you know, and that's how you tell it. And yeah, I mean, if, if somebody's telling you not to write it that way, to write it a different way, that, that's, that's what I would say to them. Mm -hmm. Yes. What have I learned about my success? Oh wow, that's a that's a pretty deep question. <laughs> oh, one of the things you know, people people ask me like, why why do you do it? You know, why do you keep working like this? Why you know why have you done all of this that you've done? And one of my answers is always that I do it because. I haven't forgotten that four-year-old Reina in Mexico and all the things that she went through. And to me, it's so important, you know, to, to not forget her because that little Reina in Mexico, she would have never been able to do anything that, you know, that I've been able to do. And, and that's why, I, and I think about her, and I think about the family I left behind, I think about all my cousins who haven't had the chance, you know, that I've had. So I do it for them as well. And I think when I look back at my life, and I think about all the sacrifices that my family made, all the, the you know, the sacrifices that, that I've made, and the, the hardships that we endured, all the pain, all the hurt, all of those things. I, I want to look back in my life and say it was worth it. It was worth it because I am here now. So this is what I think about my success, that it has allowed me to look back at my life and say that, you know, that it was all worth it because now I am here. And and I don't think you know when when you don't when you don't honor that when you don't honor your family's um, sacrifices when you don't honor all the things that that you've gone through you know to get to 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 um, to this place that you want to get to if you don't honor that and you just start making you know bad choices like dropping out of college or or doing all these things that that are harmful to you. Then, then, then you cannot look back in your life later on and say that it was worth it. So that's what I do. That's what always drives me to, you know, that I do want to look back and I do want to say that that it was worth it. And I can, I can say it. I can say it. And also being able to say that it also allows me to say that that I I can forgive and I can understand and I can love my my family, you know, despite everything we went through. So I can appreciate everything that that we all went through so that I could get to this point in my life. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much.